On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, it's the February 15th, 2022 edition of What to Ship, Top 5 Stories in the Maritime Sector. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to What to Ship, Top 5 Stories in the Maritime Sector. And today we're doing something special. Yesterday was day one of FreightWave's Global Supply Chain Week. And day one was devoted to all things maritime which made me a very happy subscriber to Freight Waves. Actually, not a subscriber. You just have to tune in to watch it. But anyway, it was great. There was nonstop coverage. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to see it all live because I had to teach, because I have this other job I have to do. And Freight Waves hasn't offered me a full-time job yet, so I still got to do this teaching job. But in the meantime, I was able to get back onto Freight Waves TV, check out their back episodes and all of it was recorded so you can go back and take a look at it i will link it in the show notes for today but i want to look at five specific topics they looked at and break it down a little bit you can watch the full interviews on freight waves but in the meantime i want to look at the top five issues and give you my take on it so let's go ahead and get started on the best maritime show on this YouTube channel by far and everything. There's others out there. You can go to Lloyd's List and Journal of Commerce and everything like that. But again, they don't have me. So this is a site uh, for FreightWaves Global Supply Chain Week running all week. Uh, and you can scroll down here and full agenda here. Each of the days are devoted to a different topic and they have a keynote each of the five days so February 14th is maritime. That's the day we're going to talk about specifically. February 15th, day two, deals with retail. February 16th, Wednesday, deals with consumer packaged goods. February 17th, Thursday, deals with automotive. And then the last day, February 18th, deals with industrial, heavy industry, oil, and gas. So the keynote speaker for the first day was John Picari the uh, Biden-Harris uh, Administration Supply Chain Disruptions Task Force Port Envoy. And John Bakari has had a very interesting relationship, in my opinion. I've, I've been kind of hard on John Bakari at times because he is the Port Envoy. He's a former Assistant Secretary of, of Transportation in the Obama administration, and he's been designated as this Port Envoy. I still think it should be the maritime administrator in this role. That's just me. But again, we still don't have a maritime administrator. Uh, Anne Phillips, who I had a video on that talked about her, uh, her nomination, has finally been kicked out of the Senate committee and up to the full Senate for confirmation. But it's on hold right now because Senator Scott from Florida has all Department of Transportation <laughs> nominees on hold. Plus, I assumed that Senator Cruz was going to put her nomination on hold based on the way that went. Anyway, so John Bakari was asked a series of questions in an interview. And I think there's a couple of things that stood out for me in the interview. One of them that he talked about, and he had said this in a previous interview with Lorianne Larocco, was that the current container volumes that we're seeing right now are no longer the ceiling, they're the floor. In other words, this is the minimum level we should expect I'm not 100% sure about that. I think we're going to be at much higher levels than we have been in the past. I don't think we're going to go down to pre-COVID levels by any means. But I don't think that the, the levels we've been at, especially the peak levels, is what we're going to be at right now. Uh, John was asked a series of questions, and, and all of them he answered in a purely political way. So, for example, he was asked about the Ocean Shipping Reform Act and the view of the carriers. Uh, those are the big ocean shippers. And he kind of deflected that question. Uh, he was asked about uh, a couple of aspects uh, about exports and imports. Uh, he was in particularly asked about exports uh, out of the West Coast and the issue within the proposed legislation by the House and Senate. Remember, there's two opposing bills coming out here one from the House, one from the Senate on the Ocean Reform Act. And Picari did not answer the question, in my opinion, at all. I, I, I mean, at all. And I want to talk about that for a minute because I think it's a key issue that he should have addressed when he had the opportunity. So I'll link over to the full interview. You can listen to John Picari talking to 
Gallagher uh, from Freight Waves on this, but one of the things that that he was directly asked regarded this issue of exports and uh, and uh, empty containers, and again he completely deflects on it. And I, I come back to this: the Port of LA and their reported of empty containers. You'll see right here they're down fourteen percent since their initial report back in November, but they still have fifty seven thousand empty containers in the port. This is the Port of LA's totals for 2021. Now, this was massive. Understand, this is the largest amount of containers the port has ever moved. 10,677,609.7. What's 0.7 of a TEU? It's, it's, they use measurements for uh, 20 footers, 40 footers, 45 footers, 53 footers. And, and so you get these point, and it's all based on 20 foot equivalent units. 10,677,609. But I want you to notice something very particular here. Loaded exports. Loaded exports. You notice in the first half of the year, nearly 100,000 containers of loaded exports went out. Also notice in the first half of the year how big the change was in the port of LA. March, 113% increase over the previous March. May, 73.99%. Look at the second half. Look at the second half. May, December down 10.53%. November down 8.8%. October down 8%. And then if you look at loaded exports, you're talking about usually less than 100,000 except for the month of August. This is the 2020 numbers right here. Every month, loaded exports over 100,000. Every month, the lowest was in May, 104,000. Last December, 120,000 exported containers. That's 70,000 over what was exported last year. Empty exports, 296,000 in 2020. In December, 328,000. And I think that's the key thing. Total loaded exports in 2021, one point nearly 2 million. Empty exports, nearly 4 million. 1.2, 4 million come over here, 1.5 million, 2.8. And this issue is critical. And John Picari, the port envoy, should be talking about it, in my opinion. He should be talking about this. And I, I think he kind of deflected away from the question. The other question that John Gallagher asked him, and I wish John would have followed up with it, but I understand. I mean, he's a news reporter. He needs access to these people. And so, you know, you know, when you ask a question, you got to be careful about follow-ups if you're a reporter. I'm not a reporter. I'm a tenured professor. I'm good. I, I can raise these issues if I want to, and I will. Uh, he asked him about what was called peer pass and the fact that the Federal Maritime Commission is, is investigating the Port of LA and Long Beach charge on peer pass. So the issue here is an incentive to get truck drivers, and we're going to hear from uh, uh, Matt Trapp over at the Harbor Trucking Association talking about drage in a minute, get truck drivers on the terminals to take containers off during non-peak hours, not during the day hours. And what's interesting here is this peer pass is charging a, a fee, what's called the traffic mitigation fee, during peak daylight times. The problem, and this is according to the FMC, uh, they're looking at it. Uh, I just want to read the statement. Let me read the statement. It'll be better. The rate charge, according to PeerPass, was done at the request of the Biden-Harris administration supply chain disruptions task force led by White House Port Envoy John Picari with the goal of incentivizing importers to move containers through off-peak night gates by charging its traffic mitigation fee only during peak daylight daytime hours but at a rate 129 percent higher yeah they're not just charging the rate the fee but they have increased the fee 129 percent Mafi, the head of the federal maritime commission says i fully support the president's port envoy and his efforts to work with the industry to find ways to reduce congestion including an incentive for greater off-peak gate use However, neither he nor others advocating off-gate incentives could have known that PeerPass proposed fee structure generates revenue well above what is currently required to implement the program in a revenue-neutral manner. PeerPass claims to be cooperating with President Biden's support envoy, but apparently only if it can rake in millions more in profit paid for by American importers. Man, why was that question not put to 
Bakari in a little bit more light. I, I would love to hear him answer that because if he's the one advocating this peer pass, then he should be the one who's sitting there looking at what they're implementing in fees charge. I will also go back when we talk with about what Matt Trapp says in his interview, the difficulty in coming in during night hours. It's just, it's just not jiving. LA and Long Beach. And fortunately, let me be clear, the first day of Global Supply Chain Week did not focus on LA and Long Beach. They looked at basically a variety of different other topics. And with that, let's go over story number two. Story number two was an interview Lorianne LaRocca did with Sam Ruda of the Port of New York and New Jersey. They did two interviews with, with port operators. Uh, this one is with New York, and then uh, Kaylee Nix did one with the uh, supervisor of the ports of South Carolina, Port of Savannah. Uh, both are great, but I want to focus on this one first because it's really good uh, for a variety of reasons. Because the Port of New York, New Jersey, Sam Ruda was, he's, he's a consummate professional. Let me be clear. This is Sam right here. Does a great interview. Just, just, just a, a, a great overall interview. But can I be clear? It's very obvious to me that Sam so much, if he wasn't such a good political guy, would have came out and said, listen, we're not screwed up like everybody else. We're operating efficiently. We're just under 9 million containers moved this year, which is, by the way, is, is LA and Long Beach each moved about 10 million. New York's moved a little less than just under 9 million containers and haven't had the backlog that LA and Long Beach have. And there's a lot of issues about that, which we'll talk about. But one of the interesting things that I thought Sam mentioned, and they, they include his key quotes here in the story. I want to talk about some of them. Number one, he's saying birth occupancy is running close to 100%. You haven't seen long lines off New York, New Jersey. Yeah, they have spikes here and there where a couple of ships will be at anchor, but nowhere near what you see LA and Long Beach. They are moving containers at literally almost the same level uh, than LA but they're not doing it. But what he did note is this, we have lost five years of planning time. We had five years of growth in 22 months. In other words, the growth he's experienced over the past two years was planned for over five years. And now they have to start thinking about infrastructure. I wanna come down to the last quote on this, on this story. We were lucky in that we completed some big infra infrastructure projects before COVID hit. The channel deepening the 50 feet in the Bayonne Bridge uh, they had to raise the Bayonne Bridge. It was too low. The air draft to get the big container ships under had to be raised. And those two projects generate a host of physical infrastructure at the terminals, birth deepening, more cranes, bigger cranes. So this run up put us in a very good position to flex its capacity. The head of the port of South, Car South Carolina said the same exact thing. We were lucky. We had infrastructure in place so that we were opening a new terminal just when this hit. Let me be clear. They're not lucky. I don't know why they said that. This was part of a plan that was put in place largely due to the expansion of the Panama Canal that opened in 2014. The East Coast, Gulf Coast ports knew bigger container ships were going to come through the Panama Canal. What previously was restricted to about 5,000 TEUs are now around 12,000 TEUs coming through. And so these ports planned for that. And part of that planning was dredging, raising bridges, and building new terminals. The Wando terminal in Savannah, for example, is the first new terminal in quite a few years. This infrastructure worked perfectly because they started it, they were planning for it in 2014, took longer, but they were in place to handle the overflow here due to COVID. It was, wasn't luck at all. It, it, was, it was good infrastructure planning by the ports of New York, New Jersey, and Savannah. However, one of the things I will note that is a lot of that infrastructure was paid for by the citizens of those areas. The Bayonne Bridge, for example, was paid for by citizens of New Jersey. It wasn't paid for by the operating companies, the ship operating companies that benefit from that terminal right now. And I think that's an issue that we can talk about. He talks about data. Data is king. God, good data is the emperor. Our model is landlord. But that doesn't exonerate our role being the steward of the assets. Each of these ports have a port system so that they can monitor the data of the containers coming in. One of the big pushes through the Ocean Reform Act that needs to be put in place is so that that data can be shared across ports in a central portal. Container companies, shipping companies are proprietary. They don't like to share their data. And what you have is siloed data so that you can't get good visibility on the movement of boxes, containers, and goods around the United States. You just don't. Your individual shippers can, but not everybody to see 
traffic flow and issues with infrastructure. And that has got to change. The other thing he talks about here is, is demurrage when containers sit on the terminals. In 2019, if you talk to the individual terminal operators, probably between three to 6% of the cargo is going into demurrage beyond the five days of free time. So when you land the container, you're giving five days on the terminal free. You can sit your containers there. It takes those first five days, you're not charged rent, basically. After that, you are. However, some companies and some terminals have agreements to leave containers on the terminal longer. That was being done when cargo was scarce and you were trying to attack, uh, attract people. So some companies worked out great deals where they could leave containers on the yards for weeks at a time. Now that's an issue and they need to get them off. So he says on here, a lot of cargo is now 11, 12, 13 days. It's a pivotal component of fluidity. Some BCOs, BCOs is, is beneficial cargo uh, owners, are using the terminal for warehousing. Now understand that's that this is both sides are guilty of this, but they need to target and change the rules now to get them off. The other thing that he isn't, it's not in this quote here, but it's in the interview. He's asked about cargo shifting from the West Coast to the East Coast. I've been talking about this for a while now. And he confirms that major, major companies are talking to him about relocating to the East Coast. He said he didn't want to, you know, you know, take profit off of competition from other ports, but he does. Let's be clear, this is competition. And he made the point the fact that Wang Hai, which is a, a, a China shipping line, is now operating on the East Coast, never operated on the East Coast before. Why are they doing this? Because they can get into New York, New Jersey, they can get in Savannah, they get in Charleston, they get to get in Norfolk, they get in Jacksonville, they get in other ports. And so you're going to see this shifting take place. So a really interesting interview, Lorianne Larocco, consummate professional, does a great interview with Sam Ruda. Definitely fun to watch. Again, it'll be in the show notes for you to take a look at. Let's jump to story number three. So story number three is an interview Greg Miller does with uh, uh, Jeffrey's Randy Giv Givens, Givians? I'm not sure how to say his last name, but Randy over at Jeffrey's. Uh, it, it's a great interview. Number one, I love any interview where uh, we get to see Greg Miller's house and everything. He's got such a great backdrop. I need to work on my backdrop. Greg has a great backdrop. And I need to emulate how Greg has his backdrop. And, and plus he likes to lean in, he likes to lean into the camera like this. He's very, very personable. I like that a lot. Maybe I need to work on this. But Randy over at Jeffrey's, he and, and, and Greg give a great interview. And I, I, I would argue it's very similar to the video I did with Jay Mintzmeyer uh, a few weeks ago, where we talked about profits and, and stocks and everything. And again, uh, they got a couple of his quotes here. And again, I'll link the, the whole video is right here. So you can watch the whole video with him. And I think Randy does absolutely right spot on the head here. I, I agree with everything he basically said here. Uh, he talked about congestion. And, and one of the things he talked about is the fact that container ships are being built at record levels. Greg specifically talked about the fact that in terms of tonnage of containers being built, container ships being built right now, 23% increase in the size of the fleet is coming online in the next few years. And, you know, when, when nearly a quarter, you're going to add a quarter capacity to the current container liners. That's amazing. I, I, I will note, however, that a lot of that tonnage is going to go away. And, and Randy mentions that too, in the interview, a lot of that tonnage is kept going right now only because of the demand. It'll go away as soon as this ends. Uh, a lot of those engines are, are, are well worn out. They're, 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 they have to pay a lot to keep them running or they're using scrubbers. Uh, you're not gonna see it, but you know, Randy makes this point. Politicians want to think they could do something, but it's really a demand story. So I think if it persists throughout 2022 and 2023, if 100, 300, 500 new ships miraculously appear tomorrow, that's not going to help anything. And I agree, you can add more ships to the congestion off LA and Long Beach, that doesn't help. The issue here is flow and throughput through the ports. If you can't move the cargo out of the ports, that's the issue. It's not container ships, it really isn't. We don't need the more capacity. What you're gonna see is a refinement in the capacity. The big question I got coming up is what size container ships are we going for? They're going right now for between 12 and 15,000 TEU ships. Ships that can traverse the Panama Canal, can swing from the west to the east coast, operate throughout Europe. That seems to be the mix. I'm also gonna be interested to see if they start building some smaller container ships with cranes operated by the big container companies. To me, that's the big issue going on. Uh, he talked about Zim. Zim is the story every stock guy who does ships will talk about. 
because Zim is is the success story. It is the company that's peanut, by the way, over there. Sorry, uh, Zim is is the success story. IPO in early 2021, and it has just climbed, climbed, climbed. And a lot of people are talking about bailing out. They talked about bailing out back in October, November when stocks started coming back down. But again, one of the things you're seeing is companies are making a lot of profits right now, and and we'll talk about the long term prospects here. Uh, with with stocks, but but the rates. There was a uh, another interview that was done here, and I think I have it right here. Uh, this was uh, yeah, this is an interview uh, that was done uh, again. Again, Greg was that just just I, I got to get my Greg Miller down, but Greg does this interview with uh, Patrick Berlin uh, over at, at Zentia, which is a anal analytical group out of Norway. And one of the things that they're talking about is long-term rates, long-term rates. So they looked at different, and there was a whole batch of interviews on this. Uh, uh, Steve Farrar uh, talked with the guys from Fredos on their index. And, and one of the things that's very clear is that the long-term rates, the 12 and 24-month rates, not the short-term, not the ones that spike all over the place, but long-term rates uh, are going to be the big issue. He says right here, on risk that rates on long-term deals may be too high if spot rates fall, a 12 to 24-month contract comes with a su substantial risk that you may look like a fool 12 or 24 months down the line. But as he talks about here, Berlin talks about the fact that these companies are getting good, solid rates and people are hedging right now. They know rates are not going to return down to the pre-COVID limits. And so they are getting in here and locking in rates because they want to ensure their volume with their containers. And those rates are going quick. Uh, Maersk is selling out future spots on their vessels quite quick to the point that they're pushing off uh, NVOCs, uh, non-vessel owner common carriers, from being able to book on their carriers. They want to save those spaces for themselves. Uh, so Zim is a big one. The other one they talk about is the non-vessel owners who are leasing their ships. Danos is amazing story. If you look back in February, March of 2020, if you bought Danos, you could buy it for $3 a share, $3 a share. It's $95 as of February 4th, 30 time raise. And, you know, everybody's saying they missed the boat on this. But again, if you go back and look at freight rates and leasing rates and everything prior to 2008, don't look early 2010s, go prior to the Great Recession of 2008, eight, freight rates were a lot higher. I mean, everything was higher back then. People have short-term memories. They don't remember this, but those rates were amazing back then. And uh, as, as both these interviews by Greg Miller talk about here with stocks and, and rates, really giving you an idea that we're not seeing, yeah, things have dipped down from the height they were at, but they are not like some people said back in October and November, they oh, we're at the top, it's crashing now. I, I, I don't know. As we'll talk about, there are other issues at play here than that. So a really interesting story uh, that, Greg, that Greg Miller did for Freight Waves. That was story number three. Sorry, I'm out of position to pause my recording. So story number four deals with the issue of drayage on the West Coast. Now, for those of you who don't know, drayage is trucking. It, it, it's typically short haul trucking. In this case, it's trucking out of the ports. And Matt Schrapp, who is the CEO of the Harbor Trucking Association, and I did a featured uh, video using Matt Schrapp's uh, discussion on it, talk about the fact that they were washing empty containers, gives a, a great talk, uh, absolutely, just, just a, a phenomenal talk here. I, again, I, I love it. You can listen to Greg's uh, directly on here and get it. And I want to break down some of his key quotes that he has on here. Uh, when we look at some of the productivity issues, it really has to do with either turn times or the ability to return these empty containers to free up the chassis to move the imports off the dock. That is for us the biggest issue we're dealing with now. Drage drivers drive max 50 miles usually. They are coming into the port, they, which means they have trucks that conform to the port of LA and Long Beach. And he mentions this, there's a big issue coming at the end of this year when trucks with engines built between 2007 and 2009 are gonna be excluded from the port. And you know, in the past, drayage trucks were typically the oldest trucks in the fleet. They're trucks that no longer do long haul. They're, they're basically used for short haul. But now because of requirements by port of LA and Long Beach, you have to have certain emissions 
you're going to need a truck newer than 2010 by the end of this year. And that's going to cost monies. Sorry, that's peanut. And that's Macy. So what Matt is talking about here is because of congestion getting in and out of the terminals, because it's so slow, instead of doing two to three runs per day for a drayage driver, and they get paid by runs, they're getting paid by the amount of hauls they're doing, they're only doing one. And that means they're losing money. They're losing money. And, and yeah, they're home at night, they get the weekends off and everything, but they are losing out on their ability to move cargo. And that's a big issue right now. Sorry, you're having the full what's going on with shipping uh, staff, uh, obviously, are having meetings behind me. Uh, he's talking about looking for qualified drivers. That is true. They're, they're, they're always looking, but they're not really in a driver shortage because as Matt says in his interview in previous interviews, if you throw more drivers into this equation, it, it just creates more congestion. They can't get the drivers who are there now to do the multiple runs. Uh, he goes down here, we're struggling with some of the anti-dumping laws. Manufacturers are still catching up on back orders. They're still looking for labor. There are still part shortages. The supply chain everywhere is affected by it, right? It is ironic that the supply chain itself is so dependent upon the supply chain in order to be able to function. I think that's the best line of this right here. So for us, it becomes a question of, of are there enough chassis or is there enough chassis available at this point because we're because they're sitting under containers? There are big issues with chassis. Understand, chassis were, were basically exported overseas to be built. And now there are tariffs on those coming in. And then there was a lawsuit against that company and it's added additional tariffs on it. And it's it, nearly impossible to get new chassis in here. And the fact that you can't get new chassis mean you have a limited number of chassis to put containers on. Add to it, the container companies want the empties. They want the empties to ship back to Asia to reload because that's cash for them. And basically, even though they got ever how many containers they have, what, 60,000 containers sitting in LA, can't get them out. They still want more empties because some of the empties that aren't the right empties, it, it, and it's just creating this backlog. And one of the things that Matt talked about, it's not in the quotes here, that I think is absolutely essential, is the fact that he talks about whether of adding a night shift and you know the, the, this, the infamous 24-7 comment that President Biden made, ports are not 24-7, they're not. They, they run from 8 a.m. to about, uh, to the evening. Uh, and I forget the exact drop-off time in the evening. But what Matt keeps talking about, this hoot shift is this shift from like three to eight, you know, 3 a.m. to 8 p.m. It doesn't do a lot. But what he says is, why are we opening the gates at 8 a.m.? 8 a.m., it's half the day is over for the drivers. They want to come in at 4, 5, 6 a.m. and load. Let's move the, the calendar over. The other thing is in the port of L.A. and Long Beach, at lunchtime, things shut down in some ports. They stop moving. And, and that means you can't load containers. There's, there's an hour there where they're changing shifts. And, and so there has to be more efficiency in the ports to move the containers in coordination with the drayage, the truck drivers. Right now, there's just still inefficiency going across. There's communication, but there has to be coordination across the line. And again, this is not Sal's opinion. This is Matt Schrapp. The CEO of the Harbor Trucking Association, watch his video and hear what he has to say, because I know I'm going to hear it from port operators who are going to sit there and say it's the truck drivers, it's not the port. It's, listen, it's everybody. And this is the reason that guys like Picari should be in there and more importantly, the Maritime Administration. And let me be clear about why I think the Maritime Administration should be in there. They have a say in the doling out of these infrastructure grants. Picari has no power whatsoever. He's an envoy. He, he can go back to the President Biden and say, well, the port was mean to me or these people were mean to me. It doesn't mean anything. If you get the Maritime Administration mad at you, you may lose infrastructure grants. They have purse strings, which equates to power. And right now, the power being doled out by the government is in the hands of someone who doesn't have a lot of power. He's got contacts. He's got visibility. Everybody loves John. You hear John talked about all the time. But he is not in a position to really delineate a lot of authority down here. That was story number four. All right, for story five, I wanted to do this story. I really did. I was hoping we were going to get an interview with the head of Bojangles to talk about the fact 
that we are in a potential supply shortage of gravy at Bojangles. And listen, I am in North Carolina. If Bojangles shuts down, this is this 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 is going to shut down North Carolina. Let me be clear. This 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 has the potential. This I, I don't know why this is not lead story. Why the keynote didn't talk about this? This this should have been a key thing. And again, you know, I I, I don't know. I, I I'm not Craig Fuller. I don't run freight waves and everything. Hi Craig, uh, and everything. You know, and by the way, what I think I should have had a freight waves vest for today, as much as I'm talking about freight waves. But again, I love the guys at freight waves. They're very nice to me. They invite me on all the time. So I, I, it's fun to do this, but again, I'll pick on them just a little bit. But again, this story should have been it. But the story I want to make you aware of for story number five is this one with Lars Jensen uh, talking to Kevin Hill. Uh, when Lars Jensen talks, I listen. And uh, some all of you guys are going to get that joke. This is a chat where it looks at potential supply chain pitfalls in 2022. Lars Jensen, who's the CEO of Vespucci Maritime, is absolutely the the oracle when it comes to container shipping uh, i think we all should listen to lars uh and lars talks in this segment about many things uh there's some great quotes in here from lars uh that you can listen to i i, I think it's it, it's really good uh he's talking about you know at the start of 2020 2022 there was a slight alleviation from after golden week. And then it was just had been progressively worse, not just in the US, but in Europe. And that's the thing, it's gotten worse. It hasn't gotten better, it's gotten worse. You know, as much as there's a log jam off LA and Long Beach, yes, it's down. It's down from a hundred vessels down to 70 vessels. But remember in October, when we're talking about 70 vessels, it was hair pulling time. Uh, port congestion has been going in one direction over the last three months, and that is steadily upwards. Look at LA, look at those figures I showed you. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. And, and that's a fundamental issue. Uh, on conditions in Europe, you don't see the same massive lines of vessels, but that's because LA and Long Beach really is not one port, it, two ports, it's one port, all coming out of the same area. It's a mega complex. It's 20 million containers a year coming out of downtown LA and Long Beach. It's a terrible place to have it. And we are jamming more into it than ever before. In Europe, on the East Coast, it's spread out. You, you go to multiple ports, but the problem is ships are coming into LA and Long Beach and dumping their entire load. What Lars talks about here are three, what he calls curveballs. And I'll talk about each of the curveballs just for a second, because I think they're really important. The first curve uh, uh, curveball or pitfall he talks about is obviously what's going on with uh, a, a variety of issues. But the big one he talks about is the West Coast and the ILWU, the International Longshoremen and Workers Union. I have received comments from ILWU workers. So their contract is up on 30 June. Uh, they need to get a new contract in place and it would start on 1st of July. Now, this is part of a three-year extension of the previous contract that they pushed out till now. The ILWU is in the best position it's ever been in to negotiate a contract. I, I mean, they can't even talk about a strike for the cataclysm that would have to the supply chain. So they are in the driver's seat of the supply chain negotiation. Now, every negotiation ever between a labor union and the group it works with is not going to get a solution on the first day. It's guaranteed. They're going to walk out. There's going to be, I want this, you want that. We're not going to agree. And eventually they're going to come together. But right now they're just at opposed to each other's. Now, normally that's fine. Nobody cares about this and, and we know it's going to happen. They'll hammer out a deal. But what it does do is create uncertainty in the market. And when you create uncertainty, you create risk and you create doubt. And what's happening here is a couple of things. We know, and I was assured, the ILW guys tell me, oh, of course we'll have a new contract. There's guaranteed we'll have a new contract. There's no doubt we'll have a new contract. I understand that. I understand that entirely. But you can't be 100% about that. And more importantly, shippers who are hauling cargo across aren't going to take the chance. So what are they going to do? They're going to front load Q1, Q2, the first half of, the, of 2022 with cargo for fear that it's going to get caught in the boats and not be able to offload for Q3, Q4, which is Christmas in the holiday season. And they're going to reroute cargo from Southern California over to other ports. Now, this is where the ILWU has to be very careful. The longer you delay this, the more impact you may have on growth of the harbor, the development of the port, if all of a sudden LA and Long Beach go from 40% down to 30%, you're giving power to other ports, particularly Savannah and New York, New Jersey and Houston. So as Lars mentioned, this is the first pitfall that has the potential to blow up. 
The second one is COVID, and particularly COVID in China. Because of the China's zero tolerance policy, they can shut down and they can shut down parts of their distribution system, which will have an impact on the movement of goods. Understand what we're seeing from, for example, Chinese New Year, it's a three to four week delay till we see it over here. And goods are jammed up in the log jam off LA and Long Beach. Uh, he talks about the fact that Flexport has a measurement to determine when cargo should be delivered usually. Usually it's about 45 days from China to delivery. Right now, Flexport has that delivery, that same delivery today, taking 110 days. Think about that for a second, 45 days to 110. If you're booking that cargo on a fairly routine basis, you're getting a shipment every month and a half. You know, every, every month and a half you know, is, is great. But now if you're getting that shipment every 110 days, that's every three months and three weeks. That means you either have to load, pack more in each of those individual shipments which fills up space, or you gotta go short. And more importantly, if you need that goods, it's got to go into later ships. And that means booking cargo later out. So all of that has a domino effect, a butterfly effect, whatever you want to call it, down the supply chain. And then the last part here, which, which I, I think, again, is, is really his interesting one, is he talked about Ukraine and Russia. And not so much Ukraine and Russia going to war, but he talked about an event that I talk about quite a bit, and that's cyber. The danger to shipping companies is cyber attacks. And he talked about in 2017, the Napietia virus that infected Maersk, which he said was an incidental attack. It, it wasn't targeted at Maersk. Maersk wound up being the target by accident, but it infected the Maersk network. And understand, when I say infected the Maersk network, I mean every computer, every server on board, every ship in every office of Maersk was hit except for one. And that was in Lagos, Nigeria, where they were having a blackout. And the only way that Maris could rebuild their data was off that hard drive, that server in Lagos, because the power had gone out in Nigeria and it hadn't been affected. But the key thing he talks about is this. In 2017, you can lose Maris for a week, for two weeks, for three weeks. And it didn't impact the supply chain significantly. If your goods were on the ship, yeah, it impacted you. But there was extra capacity out there so that if you were scheduled to load your vessel, your cargo on a Maersk ship, and now it's not running because of Dapietia, you can put it on an MSC ship or you can put it on you know, an Ocean Alliance vessel or an Alliance vessel. There was capacity if Ukraine and Russia go to war and they start flying cyber attacks, which is what's going to happen. And let me be clear, if we start supporting, and I say this in my CELA video, if we wind up supporting Ukraine, for example, they'll target companies that are hauling goods for the US military. They'll unleash a cyber attack. It's not gonna be U-boats in the Atlantic attacking ships. You're not gonna see great container ships being torpedoed. You may, but that's not the way the initial attack will come. The initial attack will be cyber. They'll go for the networks. They'll, they will send an email to every employee and every freight forward in the world 100 times per second and flood their inboxes and, and overload networks. It will be a cyber attack like we haven't seen before. And the entire supply chain counts on open communications. And I think Lars is exactly right on this, is that's always the pitfall out there. I'll add one more just because I, I again, I, I, I love what Lars says and I agree with him entirely. The other pitfall I would add out there that's the big X factor is the crews on the vessels. Because of COVID and crew rotations and the inability to get crews on and off vessels, I think that's another X factor out there that's looming on the horizon. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. This video kind of recap day one of the Global Supply Chain Week hosted by Freight Waves and Freight Waves TV. I, I, I want to just absolutely give uh, credit to Craig Fuller and the crew over there all the people who did the jobs and interviews over there and, and the great work they did. I thought it was one of the most informationally packed days I've, I've, I've ever seen. And they're doing a week of this stuff. So, you know, automotive, not my cup of tea, but maybe somebody else's. Go over to Freight Waves, check it out. Uh, I, I think they're, they're doing great services. You know, there's, of course, other sites I use on a daily basis. G Captain, Splash 24-7, Lodestar, Container News, Maritime Executive. There's some great sites out there to, to follow the maritime aspect. And the best site, the best site I can think of, if you want to follow anything maritime, is right here at What's Going On With Shipping. Go ahead, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when I come out. Go ahead and leave a comment below. Hey, if you want to help me 
make this channel even bigger, then become a Patreon member, contribute to the page. That helps me and my elite staff of Macy and Peanut to put together a show of this quality so that we can give you the information you need to be successful out there in maritime logistics and maritime supply. So until our next episode and weekly episodes of What the Ship, pretty much falling on Tuesdays right now because of my work schedule, was on Mondays, but probably gonna be on Tuesdays for now because it's better for me. So be sure to tune in and catch our next episode. So until next time, the Sal signing off. <laughs>